Started work with Bruce Lee, 1967. He was a kung fu martial artist, or gung fu, whichever word you want to use. I, being an American fighter, we didn't think much of kung fu fighters because most of them didn't fight. They did a lot of that, what we call finger painting, just type moves, you know, moving the hands around like finger painters. I was at Black Belt Magazine in Washington, D.C., complaining about how they had misspelled my name in the magazine. And um, Bruce Lee was there in the office at that time. So when I left the office, I walked out in the parking lot to go back home, and Bruce Lee comes running outside. Ah, Joe, 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 uh, let me talk to you for a second. And he stood in front of me, and for about 30 minutes, he was trying to explain to me why his Jit Kune Do style, Jit Kune Do um, means way of the stopping fist. He was talking about instead of throwing a horizontal punch like this, you throw a vertical punch. Instead of putting your power side back like a boxer would stand, you put your power side forward. And he explained many of the principles and tactics that Jeet Kune Do uh, demonstrated or utilized, uh, which made it superior to the way we were doing karate at that time. And it just all went in one ear and out the other. Uh, later in... 1968, early 68, I was doing a nightclub act with myself, Bob Wall. He, Bob Wall was the co-star of that film, End of the Dragon, and Mike Stone. We were kind of like buddies at that time. As a matter of fact, Bob and I were living together. We were business partners. At the end of each nightclub act, Mike Stone and I would do a little demonstration karate match. And then I noticed his style had changed. And he started telling me he was working out with this Chinese guy named Bruce Lee. And he said... Uh, Bruce Lee wants to work with you, you should go down and start taking lessons with him, private lessons with him. So eventually I took his advice and uh, Bruce Lee and I got in contact with each other. And once a week I would go there and take a private with Bruce and spend the whole rest of the week working on what he would show me. And it actually, in a great way, improved my fighting stuff. I'd say his main quality was uh, his charm. He could charm anybody. Uh, here's, here's a tip look up. I, every day I'd walk into his house. First thing he had to do was, oh, Chuck, Elmo's coming, come on, that's a, yeah. and then go, ah, ah, here, fill my form. You know, he's like, showing him. He always had to show some part of his body he's working on. I remember one day, he picks up a 75 pound barbell. He locks down in position, in standing position, starts on his chest, and he sticks it straight out like this, slow motion. But holds it, sustains it. Try it. Try it with half that weight, and then you know what 75 pounds feels like. And I know guys who can uh, bench press 500 pounds. They can get it out, but they can't hold it. They'll go like this, uh, and as soon as it gets out, they fall. Uh, so he's, he was pretty strong. He was a great artist, and he was very fast. He could sketch out something. Real fast. I remember him drawing a leopard. He was going to do this roll called Silent Flute, the Silophant, and he were doing together. And one of the parts, he was going to play a, the leopard man. And the leopard man does movements like a leopard. So, for example, if I'm going to throw a strike like a snake, I'll make a hand like a snake. And I'll move it like a snake, see? Now, if it's going to be like a, uh, a crane, I'll make a move like a crane. I'll strike the Adam's apple, you know, the brachial plexus. I'll strike the eyeball, see? Now, if I'm gonna move like a leopard, see, leopards have claws, okay? A bear has a certain claw, a, a tiger has another type of a claw, you follow me? So a bear would hook the wrist in this way, whereas a tiger would keep the claws straight and the rip inside out. You ever watch a lion go underneath a buffalo or something? They grab the belly this way and rip it open, see? Bruce would talk to me about those kinds of things. Now, although I was already an amateur uh, world champion and a two-time national champion before I started work with Bruce, I think he helped accelerate my career, helped me defeat all the top guys in competition at that time, and uh, helped me go back and think about getting away from point fighting and putting full contact back on the map. Let me explain. In point fighting, you throw a punch and you stop, let's say, two, three inches or sometimes maybe an inch from the target, or you can make light, light contact except for the face. And that's what point fighting is called. They're trying to feign each other out to make the other man do it. defend something that isn't coming. They expect something out. Close advances, slide thrust kick into the hidden area. Things have hurt David a little bit. 
I never understood point fighting because to me, the purpose of a punch, the purpose of a kick is to do damage. And how do you do damage if you're missing the target? I always felt accuracy was the holy grail of just about any sport. And I came back to this country and they're throwing punches and kicks, not making contact. And then you go out and you fight some little bitty guy and he just waves his foot at your head or something and they give him the victory. So that made me, well, it left a bad taste in my mouth against the sport in general. So Bruce Lee kind of got me back into the full contact stuff because we studied a lot of bo old boxing films like Willie Pep, who a lot of Italians feel is pound for pound best fighter of all time. And some people feel Sugar Ray Robinson is. We'd watch Willie Pep's footwork. We would watch the explosiveness of some of Jack Dempsey's fight films. We watched the stationary positioning of uh, the great Joe Lewis when he got on the inside, like in a in a pocket. We'd watch the distancing and mobility tactics of a uh, of a Muhammad Ali, and it kind of got me interested in the full contact as opposed to the the stationary kind of you hit me, I hit you back, your turn, my turn type fighting. So I got tired and I got kind of really disgusted with what they call point fighting and so I decided I'm going to go in and and create a new sport and just call it full contact or something so um so around 1969 I started really drifting out of the uh the point fighting tournament scene I think 68 was my best year I won 11 consecutive grand championships without a loss and I, I think that's still a record to this day 1970 is a stuntman named Lee Faulkner. He's one of my students. Uh, calls me up and he wants to do a world team championships. I agreed to fight on the West Coast team, which consisted of myself, Mike Stone, Chuck Norris, and my business partner at the time, who's Bob Wall. Bob Wall actually talked the people into putting him on the team. So I told the promoter, I said, look, the only way I'll fight on this team because I'm tired and sick of this point fighting stuff is if you give me a match where I have to wear boxing gloves and we go at it for real. He said, okay, if I get you a match, will you do it? And I said, fine. So so he asked me, who do I want to fight? Well, <laughs> I didn't like the Shotokan fighters. The Japanese fighters are very arrogant. So I started with the very top. I went down the list. And uh, everybody said no until I got down to this kid who was a California state champion, big black kid. His name was Greg Baines and he changed his name to Ohm. So I called him up, he was in Northern California, I asked him would he do a full contact match with me. He said, yeah, I'll be there, Jack. <laughs> mm. But I knocked him out in three minutes of the fight anyway, so I locked out. As I walked into the ring that night, the announcer, he says, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting ready to watch for the first time kickboxing. And that's where the word kickboxing started here in America. He used it. So in the record books, they made me the father of American kickboxing. I actually won seven different world titles, but I only claim one. Once you're a world champion, what difference does it make whether you're a 20-time world champion or a one-time world champion? I am proud of this fact. I'm, I was the first martial artist in the world to win a world championship in two different sports. I won a world title in karate and also kickboxing. Now, I won seven different titles. Some of them were amateur titles. Some of them were professional titles. Some of them were uh, no, no holes bar, like you could throw elbows. I was never knocked down in my life, so I'm kind of proud of that. I was dazed one time, that was in a training session. Joey or Bill, was a 1965 Ring Magazine rated him the fifth ranked heavyweight at all time. He used, his sparring partner at that time was um, Ken Norton. Now, at that time, Ed Fudge, who was voted the greatest boxing coach of all time, he had 23 world champions. He was training both of them. And Joe Beal used to knock Ken Norton out every day almost when they sparred with a liver shot. And Joey wanted to show me that boxers were superior to karate guys. So he got me in the ring one day and we were sparring. He popped me with that liver shot. And I saw what we call the white light. You know, just this flash of this huge white light and you back, arches back because electricity goes through your body and it just locks you up. And um, then as soon as that white light disappears, you see all these hundreds of thousands of little bitty white sparkling lights coming down. And you can't move and you can't yell because you're in such great pain. There's no air left in your lungs. 
and pardon my French, but he steps back and says, oh, God damn it, I'm going to hit you again. And he looks at me like I could see the rage. Now he wants to draw blood, you know. And, and then he yells at me, oh, and, and so I started sidestepping the way he, he, they had taught me earlier. And I go, wow, I'm, I'm about half dead, but I, I can move, you know. And he came, oh, 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 and I started to keep moving. And then I realized, you know, I don't care how much pain you're in, as long as you can move, it's harder for your opponent to finish you off if you're a moving target than if you're a stationary target. And that's why I like going back to full contact. That's why I like the kickboxing, because it was real. And there's no greater pleasure in the world on a sportsman level. You hit somebody and you, and you hear them go, <laughs> and you look in their eyes and you see, um, you just see their eyes and, I want to go see my mommy. <laughs> One of my students, Lee Falk.